Today we're going to go into the Bible and we're going to do a careful study and discover what a wonderful prophet, apostle of God, Peter, had to say. He said, if you do these things, you will never stumble. And that is a wonderful goal, and that is my prayer for every single one of you. As you've heard me say so often, we believe in the soon coming of Christ. We believe we're living in the final moments of human history. And there is nothing more important in all of the world than living ready every day to meet the Lord. Because we don't know exactly when He'll come again. And the next major prophetic event is an event called the rapture of the church. And as you've heard me teach through the years, the rapture is a signless event. We don't know. The Bible said in Matthew 24 and verse 36 that no man knows the day nor the hour that the Son of Man will return, no, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. And the Bible is very clear. There really is an eternity. There really is a heaven. There really is a hell. And you need to live every day in right relationship with the Lord. If you're listening and uh, through one of the means of technology and one of the platforms through which you'll receive this teaching. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, that is our number one goal at Lost Lamb Association. If you've never heard me state the vision of the ministry that I wrote down when I was 17 years old in a prayer room in East Providence, Rhode Island at Bible College at Zion Bible Institute, and we've lived by that vision from 17 years old until today. And that vision is, quote, independence upon God. Our goal is to lead one million people to a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. End of quote. If you don't have that knowledge, at the end of this teaching, I'd love to have the privilege of praying with you. You need to have that assurance. And that's why this study... If you do these things, you will never stumble. You will never fail. There is a security that we can have in our faith and in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ where we don't live with question marks in our heart or in our head as to where we stand with God. And so with that said, let's open our Bibles and read 2 Peter chapter 1. And go down to verse 3. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. The Bible said, By His divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know Him, the One who called us to Himself by means of His marvelous glory, and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith. I like that and we're going to come back to that today. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with patient endurance, and patient endurance with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love for everyone. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to develop in this way 
are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. So dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. Do these things, and I want you to highlight this, and you will never fall away. If you do these things, you will never fall away. Verse 11, then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Therefore, I will always remind you about these things, even though you already know them and are standing firm in the truth you have been taught. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, once again, as we open up the Bible, we come to you with a sincere awareness of our total dependence upon you. And we thank you that you have promised us that as your sons and as your daughters, that you have given to us the Holy Spirit who will guide us into all truth. And so today as we open up the Holy Bible and share with these precious listeners, I pray that each and every one of them will be able to attain what Peter is talking about, that they will have a walk and a faith and a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that is so secure that they'll never fall away. My prayer for them and for their family and for their loved ones is that each and every one of them would be ready to meet the Lord and that none of them would be absent in eternity's morning. And so by that same Holy Spirit, guide us, teach us, and cause the Word of God to be illuminated in minds and hearts, and may we apply it and be more like Jesus every day is our prayer. Thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We thank you today for salvation available to all who call upon the name of the Lord. And for those who may listen to this teaching through whatever platform that they are currently listening. If they're not ready to meet the Lord, let today be the day. That they in childlike faith repent, turn from sin, and turn to Christ. And thank you for the promise that all who do shall be saved. May it be so for the honor and the glory of God, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, in this teaching, I thought this morning as I was editing and preparing my final notes uh, that I would do something with you that I always do. Uh, I always teach you that when you study the scriptures, it's oftentimes good to have more than one translation of the Bible. Now, I have multiple translations of the Bible. Uh, it's what I do. God has called me as an evangelist to handle the Word of God. And so I frequently add uh, good, modern, accurate translations of the Bible to li my library. And when I study, I oftentimes do that with several translations. Uh, I did that just recently with the book of Philippians. I was studying the book of Philippians, and as I also have taught you, uh, when possible, read the entire book in one setting. Now, that's going to require some time. Uh, that's going to require you to make a decision of great sacrifice that tonight I'm not going to watch a Hallmark movie. I'm going to sit down and read my Bible for a little bit. But I did that just a few days ago with the book of Philippians. I was studying and uh, interested in something I was developing, and so I took out three translations of the Bible, uh, which was the New Living Translation, uh, the NASB, the New American Standard Bible, and the ESV, the English Standard Version. I took those three versions of the Bible at my desk, and I read the entire book of Philippians six times. I read it twice. 
uh, from beginning to end out of the New Living Translation. I then read it two more times, front to back, uh, out of the New American Standard Bible. And then I read it two more times, for a total of six times, out of the ESV, the English Standard Version. And I do that as a preacher, as an evangelist, and in teaching the Scripture, because there are certain things that you'll glean from the Bible when you read the total narrative. And as I so often emphasize, don't be guilty of picking up a Bible and just reading a text here or a passage there or searching through a Bible trying to find a verse to support something that you already believe. Learn to study the Bible as a student of the Word. Paul told Timothy to study, to show yourself approved unto God. And uh, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. There's work in studying the Scripture, but you can do this. And so I thought, for example, today uh, that I would pick up a second version of the Bible. And this passage is so powerful and so current, even though it was written so long ago. And the centuries have gone by. But what Peter writes here seems like it is more relevant to where we are currently living in the 21st century with the soon coming of Christ than ever before. Because there is a great falling away. There is an apostasy in many evangelical denominations and people are departing from the truth. And they're beginning to take liberal positions on the things of God that God has no wavering in. So I'm going to uh, pick up the NSAB and I'm going to uh, read again, and I want you to listen, and uh, I think this is just a practical lesson uh, for many of you, but listen to this again in a different version. Beginning at verse 3, the New American Standard Bible, seeing that His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. For by these He has granted to us His precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Verse 5, Now for this very reason also, Applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing. Pause right there. Peter is emphasizing something very practical, and you need to get a hold of this. If you have your Bible, highlight it. Two things. He wants you to understand these qualities in such a way that they become who you are. They're yours. They're a part of your nature, your, your characteristics, your personality, your Christian conduct. They're yours, and secondly, that they are increasing. We never can come to a position of stopping growth in the kingdom of God. We must always be increasing. In John's gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the fourth gospel in the third chapter, and I believe it's the 30th verse, the Bible says, He, Jesus, must increase and I must decrease. And that is an encapsulated challenge for all of us, that we must always be decreasing as to who we are, and Christ must always be increasing in place of our submission to who He is. Let's go down uh, again to verse 8. For if these qualities are yours, number one, and are increasing, number two, 
they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, here it is again, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. All right, let's begin to look at this passage and give a little deeper explanation. How is it that we can come to a place in faith in Christ where we have an assurance and a confidence that we'll never stumble? Do you have that security today? Many don't. Many people in my travels come up to me and you can tell by the questions or, or what they're sharing that they don't have a full assurance. And uh, they'll say, well, you know, pray for me that God will help me uh, to remain faithful. Well, I'll be happy to pray for you. But I want you to develop, and if you follow this ministry, and if you follow this teaching, and I emphasize that because if you follow the Bible which we're presenting, that above all, I am going to, as a man of God, open the Bible for you, explain it in such a way that you will grow, you will learn, you will increase. I never come to you unprepared. I never come to you where I have not prayed for you. I never come to you without handling the Bible with a fearful responsibility that one day I'll stand before God and give an account for not only how I handled the Bible, but how I shared it with those who sat as an audience to the calling of God upon my life. In verse 1, as in uh, the previous letter, and I'm going to back up a few verses because uh, this is Paul, or excuse me, this is Peter's second letter. And as he begins his second letter, in verse 1, he does so uh, in the exact same fashion that he did with his first letter. In your Bible, you'll find 1 Peter and 2 Peter. And of course, uh, Peter is one of the original 12 disciples whom Christ called. He's known as that rough and rugged fisherman. Uh, he's oftentimes known for uh, not only things that he did well, but things that he failed in. Many people who study the Bible will remember that at the campfire, going into the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, he denied the Lord three times. Uh, many remember his failure in the garden when they came to apprehend and arrest Jesus and take him to crucify him. It was Peter who drew the sword and whacked the ear off of an individual. And one can only uh, imagine that he was not aiming for the ear, that he probably was trying to behead one of the uh, individuals that came to take Jesus away from him. But nonetheless, uh, Peter is an example of someone whom Christ called, who was imperfect. Are you imperfect? I am. There's no such thing as a perfect Christian. There's no such thing as a perfect church. There's no such thing as a perfect pastor. I oftentimes share with people who can become uh, carnal and overly critical. Uh, it, don't be that way, by the way. Don't be one of those Christians who's always critiquing your pastor and uh, critiquing your church and walking away trying to find something negative or something I didn't uh, enjoy or I'm not so sure I believe that or uh, the music was too loud or the, the worship was way too long or I didn't like the fact that they took an offering and talked about money. And Don't be one of those infantile, immature Christians who always find something negative. When you enter into the house of God, you enter into the house of God for biblical reasons. Number one, 
I go to church not because I'm in love with my pastor or I'm in love with my church or I'm in love with the congregation and think they're perfect. I go to church, number one, because it's been commanded in the scriptures. I go to church because it's a holy institution created by God. I go to church because every Sunday morning, God is able to look down and take a roll call and see who's in true covenant with him. I go to church because it's a privilege. I go to church because it gives me an opportunity with fellow believers to lift my hands and to thank God for his grace and his mercy that week. It gives me an opportunity as my pastor opens the Bible to open my Bible with him. And instead of being critical or a know-it-all or arrogant, uh, to have an attitude of, Lord, speak to me today. Uh, speak to me through the message. Let something that is said uh, refine me and help me. Please don't become a critical Christian. Love the church. Love your pastor. Love the believers whom you attend with, as you're going to see in this passage. It's one of the keys to never falling away. And uh, so I always remind people, there's no such thing as a perfect church. There's no such thing as a perfect congregation. And there's no such thing as a church with a perfect pastor. And if you ever find a perfect church with perfect people and a perfect pastor, don't attend there because you'll spoil it. Uh, we just always need to remember we're in perfect people. And Peter was imperfect. As a matter of fact, Many scholars believe that Peter may not have even been fully literate. Uh, many in the first century were not literate. Uh, many of these rough and tough, normal, day in, day out, uh, nine to five, or uh, you know, blue collar people, whatever phrase you'd like to give to define characters like Peter, they didn't have the ability to read or to write. Uh, some scholars speculate that Peter didn't write first. Peter or 2 Peter, but that he had to have somebody sit with him. And as he shared what God by the Holy Spirit inspired him to write, somebody either wrote for him or wrote with him. It's not important. We don't know that for an absolute fact. All we know is that the letters of 1 and 2 Peter were included in the canon of Scripture they proved all of the tests of criticism and historicity and authenticity. They're the word of the living God. All scripture is given by God and is inspired and God breathed. And so were first and second Peter. But Peter uniquely as he begins both of these letters introduces himself with his credentials uh, as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. He not only identifies himself he then goes on to identify his audience. Uh, again, for emphasis, when I talk to you about, as a believer, how you read your Bible and how you properly understand and interpret the Scriptures, how many times have you heard me say you need to understand the author? Number two, you need to understand the audience. Whom is the author speaking to? Uh, you need to understand culture. Uh, you need to understand, in many cases, a literary context. And so we're walking this out with you as we teach. I oftentimes not only challenge you to do that as a growing student of the Bible, but we do it by example in how we present the Word of God to you. And so we know who Peter is. We know who the author is. Uh, we know who his audience is. We know that this was written in the first century. Go down to verse 2. In verse 2, he adds a reminder concerning true grace and peace. And uh, as always, I hope that you have your Bible and a highlighter. And I'd like for you to highlight those words, grace and peace. And Peter reminds us as to the only place that grace and peace can be found Peter clearly says it's only found in the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord. And I even want you to notice the succession. Grace first, peace second. 
You'll never really have peace in your heart. You'll never really have peace in your mind. You'll never really have peace about life until you have right relationship with God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, as I've already said in the moments to come, I'd like to have the privilege of praying with you if you've never done that. If you've never repented of sin and received Jesus Christ, today's your day. And I'm here specifically to help you. But notice that grace first. Uh, Ephesians 2 tells us, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. And so Peter is emphasizing that here. Grace first. You have to come to faith in Christ and receive salvation by God's grace. And once you have received the forgiveness of sins and right relationship with God, then the peace of God that passes all understanding will begin to work in your mind, in your spirit, and in your life. Do you have peace today or are you allowing all of the things that are going on in our troubled world to steal that peace. I have perfect peace. As someone mentioned the other day, some of the extreme mandates that our governor is making in our states and said this is gonna destroy our state. And uh, I just said no and uh, in my text. And uh, they responded, what do you mean? I said the words of the governor are noise that my ears cannot hear. I'm not worried about governors. I'm not worried about politics. I'm not worried about anything because I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him unto that perfect day. The government's not in control. Your governor's not in control. Your local officials are not in control. The devil is not in control. Godless people are not in control. God is in control. And we have peace in knowing that the prophecies of this precious Bible will be fulfilled exactly as God said. And the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is still alive and well in this world. And in these last days, the church cannot fail. The church will always move forward and upward under the coming of the Lord Jesus. And so is your path if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ and a member of his holy church and faithful. You're unstoppable in the Lord Jesus Christ. I remind you of the promise and the prophecy of Jesus. He said in Luke's gospel, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so I sleep peacefully every night. I live peacefully every day. I have no worry or concern because God doesn't have any problems. God has plans. I tweeted that yesterday. God has no problems. God only has plans. And as you follow the plans of God, which are carefully taught to us in the Holy Bible, it'll change the way that you operate uh, every single day of your life. In this passage, Peter is, is actually uh, giving a call to spiritual growth. As a matter of fact, if you were to ask me uh, with all of these verses that I've read to you, what is the dominant narrative? What is the predominant theme that the Apostle Peter is trying to tell us in these verses. Uh, it's a call to spiritual growth if you're taking notes. Peter tells us that the best answer to remaining faithful and avoiding false teaching, and uh, as always, uh, don't forget that false teaching is not a modern problem. Uh, false teaching has been a problem from the infancy of the first century church until now. And uh, social media has only made it more flagrant 
and uh, more viral. There are more false teachers, it seems like, than ever before, and people sitting behind a camera and a microphone pretending to be uh, prophets and apostles. There are real prophets. There are real apostles. There are real uh, evangelists. There are real pastors and teachers. Uh, but there are a lot of pretenders, and social media, unfortunately, has been overtaken with a lot of pretenders. That's why it's so important that you attach yourself uh, to a real man of God or to a real woman of God and that you keep yourself connected to spiritual mentorship. As I say in almost every teaching and broadcast, I'd like to be your trusted voice for understanding the truth of the Bible and in particular Bible prophecy. And Peter is saying that the best answer to false teaching is for Christians to make progress, not only in their understanding of faith, but in living it out. Can I emphasize that just for a moment? Very important that you understand this. The life cycle of Christian spiritual growth is attaining knowledge, but that's only half. It's growing and attaining knowledge of the Word, but then it is also applying it as to how I live. That's why the scripture tells us in various passages, be not only hearers of the word, but be ye doers of the word. Even in the last book of Revelation, in the first chapter, the Bible tells us concerning the vision of Revelation that there's a special blessing given to those who read the Revelation, to those who listen to the revelation, and to those who not only hear it, but obey it. Progress in the Christian life is made possible by two practical factors. Write that down. Progress in your Christian life is made possible by two practical factors. Number one the power of God, and number two, the promises of God. This is how you progress. This is the entry doorway into the household of spiritual growth and progression and maturity. Number one, God's power. Number two, God's promises. They'll always walk hand in hand. Uh, just for a moment, I want you to go down uh, to what I would consider to be one of the key verses in this passage that I've read to you. Uh, go down to 2 Peter chapter 1, and then go down to verse 10, and let me read it to you, and I'm back in the New Living Translation. So, dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. Do these things and you will never fall away. Back to the theme of what I want to impart to you today. This is the gold nugget that we're mining out of the Bible today. That if you do these things, you will never fall away. What a wonderful promise in the Bible. I mean, that's encouraging. That's good news. Uh, in a day where we're overtaken with negativity and hatred and bad news and uh, inaccurate press, this is good news, believer. If you're a follower of Christ, the Bible is telling you, here's all you need to do to make sure that you're ready to meet the Lord every day of your life and you have a security of knowing you'll never fall away. Well, one of the first things that I hope you'll write down in your notes is that this proves to us that Christians can fall away. You know, many times I've been asked through the years on the question of eternal security. Do you believe the Bible teaches eternal security? Uh, do you believe that the Bible teaches once saved, always saved? 
And I always preface my answer by saying, I certainly don't believe in eternal insecurity. But if you're asking me that once a person comes to Christ, that they can live any way they want to live after that day of repentance and that they'll always be saved and always ready? Well, the answer to that is no. And by the way, I'll not take the time to go very deep in that because I have an entire teaching on that. I believe it's in our video archives. I believe it's in our archives on our Facebook ministry channel. I believe it's in our archives on our YouTube channel. And I believe it's also archived in our podcast channel. And I hope you'll subscribe to all of those. Uh, whichever uh, one you use most frequently, they're available to you. But I do an entire series on eternal security and once saved, always saved. So if that's something that's really plagued your mind and you need some further teaching on that, uh, avail yourself uh, to the ample resources that I've already taught concerning that subject. But this passage is actually one of the proofs that Christians can fall away from faith because Peter has said in verse 10 that if you do these things, you will never fall away. Well, whatever is true forwards is always true backwards. In other words, the antithesis of this is if you don't do these things, there is a possibility that you will fall away, even to the extreme of forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins, Peter writes. I want you in verse 10 to be sure to highlight that. Never fall. And uh, those words rendered in the English, never fall, uh, from the original text mean uh, to knock your foot on something and stumble. And probably everybody can identify with that. Probably everyone can identify with getting up in the middle of the night or walking through your home or a hotel room or a room where you're not familiar with the furniture and with the lights off, you kick your foot or kick your toe and stumble. By the way, kicking your toe in the middle of the night upon furniture is one of the best ways I know to get baptized in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> it'll, it'll cause you to have utterances from down deep within, and in that moment you'll find out how much carnality is still alive and well in your spirit. But that's what this literally means rendered from the Greek text. It means to knock your foot on something and to stumble and to fall. The man who has acquired these graces that are taught in Peter's writing here are freed from the stumbling blocks and your vision becomes clear to see. You know, uh, most of you know my deep love and devotion uh, to Bible prophecy, uh, probably a great portion of what I preach and teach and is available on all of our social media platforms. Uh, there is probably more on eschatology and the end times and Bible prophecy uh, than anything else because it's something, number one, God has called me to, and number two, you're literally living in a day and an hour in which you can watch the headlines of the modern world match up with the pages of final Bible prophecy. But I want you to go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 because there's another important verse. And when I say important verse, obviously I think you understand all of the Bible is important. But I'm talking about importance in terms of application to where we're at. Uh, but go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 because not only does the Bible tell us that falling away from faith is possible, the Bible tells us that falling away from faith is a sign of final Bible prophecy. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning to read at verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. 
Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day, don't miss this, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. And so here in 2 Thessalonians, the author of 2 Thessalonians is the Apostle Paul. He's writing to an infant church in Thessalonica. By and large, his audience is all new believers, uh, most of which had been saved for weeks and uh, at best a minimum of months. And so Paul in 1st and in 2nd Thessalonians is writing to the church at Thessalonica, this infant church with infant believers, and he's telling them that in Bible prophecy, that in the last days before the revelation of the Antichrist, that there is going to be a great falling away from faith. And so I'm trying to emphasize and explain to you an exegete from Scripture that falling away from your faith is possible. And I'm not teaching you that to breed insecurity. I'm teaching you that to breed responsibility and maturity in your understanding. You have to grow. You must progress. You must do, and I commend you by the way, I applaud you, hats off, because those that really need to hear this are not listening, but you do. You have made it a part of your Christian conduct. You have made it a part of your Bible study. You have made it a part of your devotion to learn the Holy Bible and to apply it to your life to come and to sit with me and to learn what the Bible says. And so I applaud you because you are doing what it takes to never fall away. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. And of course, Timothy is Paul's protege in the ministry. Uh, Paul writes to him two separate letters. Uh, we know that Timothy is a pastor. And in 1 Timothy chapter 4, the Bible says, Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, here it is again, that in the last times, some will turn away from their true faith and they will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. So, I know that not every scholar agrees with this. I know that there are Bible teachers and educated people and individuals with degrees in theology that adhere to once saved, always saved. But I politely but strongly disagree with them because of the multiple passages, and I'm only showing you a handful, that we're warned not to fall away, that we're told, here are the steps you must take to ensure that you don't fall away, where the scripture prophesies that in the last days there will be a great falling away from faith. And uh, something very, very, very important. Don't miss it. Let me have your undivided attention. When it comes to my interpretation of the scripture, I always am going to do my best to be absolutely accurate, obvious. I, I hope that would go without saying, but uh, the old saying, that which goes without saying needs to be said. I always come to you with a very stout devotion to properly teaching and interpreting the scripture to original text and context and total narrative. However, here it is, don't miss it. Where there are variances of opinions in scholarship, I'm not going to be mean-spirited and uh, attack those individuals because they're brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ. 
I think those of us that handle the word of God as a part of Christian maturity, we need to be gracious, even with those who may not believe or interpret or see what the scripture says, perhaps in the same vein of thought. And so I'm not going to attack them, and I'm not going to be arrogant, and I'm not going to say they're idiots and fools. And, you know, that's not how godly men or godly women conduct themselves. Uh, but I am going to be honest enough to tell you this, and here it is, don't miss it. I'm always, if there's any error, and I pray that there's not, but if there is any error, and let's just suppose on some teaching, uh, their right and my understanding of the scripture is erroneous. Let it be said, don't miss it, I'm always going to err on the side of your eternal safety. I'm always, if there is error, and I pray that there's not, I diligently study and work and research to make sure that there's not. But I promise to you that I'll always err. If I err, I'm always going to lean towards the side of your security and your eternal safety because for example, those that may teach once saved, always saved. If they're wrong, then thousands upon thousands upon thousands of untold people who thought they were Christians because one time they prayed a sinner's prayer. But because somebody told them that once saved, always saved, or eternal security allowed them the license to not sanctify their lives and not fully consecrate themselves to holiness. And they lived and tolerated certain sins and, and certain things that were displeasing and failures of Christ-likeness. And when the rapture takes place, they're left behind. I'm never going to do that to you. I'm always going to strongly lean towards the interpretation that provides your ultimate safety. I don't want your blood on my hands on eternity's morning. And so know that as you follow this ministry and as you uh, have attached yourself to me and as I have attached myself to you through the common denominator of the Holy Bible, I'm always going to ensure that the steps that you take in handling the scripture keep you in the center of the road that leads to right relationship with God and eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. Uh, go to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. And let's just go one chapter forward. And go down to verse 20 and through verse 22, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. And when people escape from the wickedness of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and then get tangled up and enslaved by sin again, they are worse off than before. There it is again. Very clear. People who have escaped the wickedness of this world by coming to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and then get tangled up and enslaved by sin again. There is another substantial biblical statement that talks about the possibility of erring in your faith and falling away. They are worse off than before. It would be better if they had never known the way of righteousness than to know it and then reject the command that they were given to live a holy life. Once you receive Jesus Christ, that is not the end of what God's going to do with your life. It's just the beginning. And you have been instructed and empowered and equipped and given everything that you need in Christ Jesus to then live a holy life. Listen to what Peter says. They prove the truth of this proverb. A dog returns to its vomit. And another says a washed pig returns to the mud. 
How can you not see? In all of these passages that I've taken the time to share with you, that there is a definitive step in receiving grace and coming into peace and relationship with God through Christ. There is salvation, but there is also a willful turning away. Now, you know, many times those on that other side of scholarship will say, but Tiff, the Bible says that we're in the hand of God and no man can pluck us out. That's absolutely true. No one can remove you from your security in God. But salvation does not take from you free moral agency. No one can take you out, but you can walk out. No one can break into your home and take you from the security of your salvation, but you can open the front door and wander away. Very, very important. Uh, let me close with this. Peter is telling us that because as Christians we have all of these resources that God has provided. And do you remember the two main practical resources? Uh, I'll remind you, and I hope you have them written in your notes. Number one, the power of God. Number two, the promises of God. And the Bible is a living book, as I always remind you. It is a book unlike any other book it is a living, breathing, active book. The Word of God, Hebrews says, is active and powerful like a two-edged sword, rightly dividing truth. This active book, the promises of God, is always accompanied by the power of God. The Bible says, knowing these things, your goal, and Peter lists them, love, brotherly kindness, godliness, perseverance, self-control, knowledge, goodness, faith. Uh, faith, write this down, faith always must express itself in action. That's the true test of faith. Faith without works is dead. Now, listen carefully. We do not earn our salvation by our works, but by grace and faith in Christ alone. However, the proof that you have real faith is in works and goodness. And this experience deepens our knowledge of God. And in deepening our knowledge of God, it deepens our knowledge of who we are. It's impossible to grow in a knowledge of who God is and not grow in a knowledge of who you are. And as you get to know who you are, it becomes easier uh, to realize what areas of your life are not Christ-like. And listen, part of your Christian growth is you should pray that the Holy Spirit will always speak to you about anything that you do, anything that you say, even the motives of what you do and say. You should always ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you if it's Christ-like. Are my motives Christ-like? Are my words Christ-like? Are my actions Christ-like? Is my personality Christ-like? Is my nature becoming more like Christ? This in turn, according to Peter, calls for perseverance. And perseverance is developed, don't miss this, you can write this down. Perseverance is developed by keeping in view the eternal goal. If you don't understand the eternal goal, which is eternal life, ruling and reigning with Christ forever, being separated from an ungodly world and brought as part of God's kingdom into a new world where everyone is right with Christ, that's coming, a new heaven and a new earth, as we've taught you in prophecy, this goal is the motivation factor in perseverance. That's why prophecy is so important. That's why preaching and teaching on Bible prophecy is so important. It keeps the end goal constantly dangling before your eyes. And when you understand where you're headed, it'll not distract you from going left and right in this ungodly world. This attitude to God facilitates a new openness also to our fellow Christians. And Peter mentioned that, brotherly kindness. 
It is impossible to love God and not love the family of God. And when I see people in the family of God who treat brothers and sisters in Christ with dishonor and disrespect, criticism, harshness, uh, impulsive judgment, and so on, they actually are condemning their own immaturity because it shows me that you don't know God and you don't love God in the way that a progressive, growing spiritual Christian should. It lets me know that you're still infantile in your faith. Because as you grow in your knowledge of God, you grow in your knowledge of who you are, which helps you to understand and to be patient with your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Godly people are not critical people. Godly, mature people are not harsh, judgmental people. The signs of godliness are grace, mercy, humility, Kindness, love, perseverance. Peter's saying these are the godly characteristics that prove maturity. So Christians face two staggering possibilities. Write that down. Christians face two possibilities. Number one, on one hand, you're going to commit yourself to developing these qualities in an increasing measure and become a fruitful Christian. In other words, number one is you make a decision, I'm going to be a progressive Christian. I'm going to grow in my faith. I'm going to grow in my knowledge of the Holy Bible. It's impossible to grow without it. I'm going to grow in my understanding of the church and of brothers and sisters in Christ. Or, on the other hand, you'll ignore this provision and the Bible says your response, unique words, short-sighted and blind. Short-sighted and blind. Sharing the life of God leads to a productive Christian life. Goodness points to the process and the assimilation of these things that Peter is also instructing us. The connection between practical Christian living and developing knowledge is referred to over and over throughout the scriptures. And Christ taught it uh, very strongly as well. Perseverance is the ability to hold fast in spite of opposition and persecution. Make no mistake. Not everybody's going to share your faith. Not everybody's going to appreciate your Christian view. There are going to be people who are going to curse at you, mock you, make fun of you, uh, say, ah, you know, that's the crutch of the uneducated. But perseverance is the ability to hold fast in spite of all opposition, in spite of all criticism. Uh, Joshua had that in his spirit when he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Again, I want to emphasize brotherly kindness because we oftentimes in the church don't emphasize this as Peter did as one of the keys to never falling. How you treat other Christians has a whole lot to say about who you are in Christ Jesus. Peter may mean that such people, when he said, are blind and short-sighted. Peter may mean that such people are short-sighted because they cannot look back far enough to remember the sins from which they were delivered. When you remember how far God brought you, when you remember who you were before Christ Jesus became Lord and Savior, you can't help but get up off of your knees in prayer every day and walk with humility and thankfulness to the Lord. And then lastly, the ultimate goal is full and final salvation. And we see that uh, in verses 10 and 11. The final and ultimate goal is full and final salvation. Peter urges his fellow Christians to demonstrate the reality of their own standing with God by following all of these characteristics. 
In this way, Peter said, you'll be kept from falling in this life and welcomed enthusiastically into the Lord's eternal kingdom. And uh, remember, Peter's not teaching that salvation is to be earned by good works, but rather he's reminding us that development of a genuinely Christ-like character is proof, not only to ourself, but proof to others that we as Christians are developing as the Lord wants us to be. One last verse from the Bible, and then we'll pray. Go into that small book of Jude. Just one chapter, right before the book of Revelation, the second to last book of your Bible. And go down to verse 24. Now all glory to God who is able to keep you from falling away. Highlight that. What a wonderful promise. Glory to God who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time and in the present and beyond all time. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. I see four things quite commonly with people that I know are falling. It seems like, and I I try to give application at the end of our time together in a way that you can take and, and, and put it on like a, an article of clothing that's been tailored to fit you. And I'm going to give you some application that will encourage you or it may convict you depending on where you're at in your process of growth. But I see four common mistakes with people who are in the process of falling away. And what's sad is oftentimes they don't even know they're falling away. Number one, they're not reading their Bible every day. They've come to a place where they think they can get away with an occasional uh, visit to church and the Bible's read there or, you know, they may read a verse here or a verse there or look at a devotional in a book or online, but they're not reading their Bible every day, realizing that as a follower of Christ, I must continue in His Word, Jesus said. Number two, they're not praying every day. Bible said in all your ways to acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. Let me tell you something. The enemy of your faith is in business 24-7 and you need to be in prayer 24-7. I'm not talking about on your knees all the time, but in all your ways acknowledge him, the Bible says. Jesus said in Luke, men ought always to pray and not to faint. Prayer is like breathing in and out for a mature, growing Christian. You talk to God about everything. I talked to him this morning when I woke up. I was talking to him as I was reading my Bible and editing my notes and asking for his help. I was talking to him as I drove to the office today about schedule and responsibilities. And uh, I'm like you. There are many times that it seems like I've got a hundred hours of work and 24 hours to get it done and I struggle sometimes in trying to get everything done with what's going on in my life. I'm just like you in that way. But I pray and I ask God to help me. I prayed for you. I prayed for those that might be listening who don't know Christ that today would be their day that the Holy Spirit would convict them of sin and call them to Christ. People that are falling away don't read their Bibles. They don't pray faithfully. Don't get mad at me but they're not faithful to a local church. I've emphasized it over and over. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is holy. It is a sacred institution. Jesus Christ died on the cross and shed his blood to give birth to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, and even more so in the last days. 
We face many hurdles currently. We face a lot of mandates currently. Uh, and many states here in the U.S. and around the world are facing uh, mandated closures and mandated opposition. It's a unique time. But I challenge you, I plead with you, be faithful to your local church. Honor your local church. You may not know this, but there are people in your local church that need you. They need your example. They need your fellowship. They need your encouraging word. They may never come to you and tell you that they admire you or look up to you. But when you're missing from the fellowship, there's something that's missing in their young faith. If you're a Christian man, there are young men in your church that watch you and need you. If you're a Christian woman, there are women in your church and young women in your church and boys and girls in your church. They need you. As much as is possible, be found faithful in these last days to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when you are absent from the church, it's like pulling a stick out of a fire. That fire burns brightly. But if you pull a stick out of a fire and put it by itself, it will soon go out much quicker. Stay in the church. Stay in that holy institution. Do everything in your power to honor and be a part of the fellowship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the fourth mistake I see from many people that fall away is they have no passion for souls. They're not praying for unsaved family. They're not praying for unsaved loved ones. They're so busy with their world and their goals and their business and their money and their aspirations that they don't consider that there are people that they come in contact with who are eternally lost and need Jesus Christ. Pray every day that the Lord will make you the salt and the light and the witness that you should be. Be a soul winner. A.W. Tozer in one of his books said, there's only two classifications of Christians, soul winners and backsliders. Keep a close watch on those four Christian habits. Read your Bible every day. Pray every day. Be faithful to a Bible-believing church with a godly pastor. And fourthly, be a soul winner. Care about others. Affect eternity. Maybe you're watching this teaching or listening to this teaching and you've never really settled that question mark in your own heart as to whether you're right with God. Would you like to be sure today? Would you like to have that knowledge that not only am I right with God, but He's going to keep me from falling and I'm going to be ready when the trumpet of the Lord sounds. When Christ comes, I'm not going to be left behind, but I'm going to be taken to be with the Lord forever and forever. You can do that today. Maybe you're backslidden away from God. Maybe as I've been teaching today, you've realized that there's been some falling away in your own Christian conduct and faith, and you want to shore that up today. Come back home and anchor it in the Word of God and in commitment. Will you pray with me? Whether you're receiving Christ for the first time or you're away from the Lord and you're coming back, if you feel the tongue of the Holy Spirit to pray, don't hesitate. Pray with me right now. Just say, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. I acknowledge my need of Jesus Christ. And I admit my sins and my failures and my falling away. And I trust in the cross and in the grace of God and in the blood that was shed for my cleansing and my forgiveness. Forgive me, Lord. In childlike faith, I repent. I turn from sin and I turn to Christ. Come into my heart and be my sure salvation. And today I vow I'll live for you I'll serve you all the days of my life. And I thank you that as you have given me the Bible and all of these resources, 
You'll keep me from falling away in these last days. Help me to be a soul winner. Help me to lead friends and family to Christ. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.